Good morning and welcome to church. Man, it's so, it's so good to be with you all this morning. And just to you people online, welcome. We're so happy you're connecting with us. And we promise that today is going to be exceptional. Okay, well, depending on how you receive the message, obviously, but we do believe it's going to impact you and change some lives. Let's just open in a quick prayer. Lord, thank you for being with us this morning. And we pray this morning, Lord, that each one of us would put our hope fully in you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So I got this exciting message called The Day the Signal Died. Now, I don't know if you've ever at any stage imagined what would happen the day the world goes absolutely quiet. There's like no phones, no WhatsApp, no Facebook. I know some of you are going, yeah, bring it on. But what about if there was no Instagram or no Twitter or no news, no nothing? I mean, can you imagine not receiving emails? Can you imagine not having to make or receive, not able to make or receive a call? The airways have gone quiet. Sounds like a Hollywood blockbuster movie, the day the signal died. That would be disastrous. In our modern times, it would be disastrous. It would be a death blow for the world as we know it. It would be unbearable for many people. It will cause panic, mayhem, stock markets would crash, uh, armies would rise up to defend in case they've been invaded. It would be the literally, the word, the world would literally implode if the signal had to die. Can you imagine streets filled with panic-stricken people, completely lost, unable to comprehend the current reality of a world without signal? It's like the worst kind of nightmares, like a zombie apocalypse. Or you, you, you'll have people literally walking around with their phones and like, signal, where's the signal? And, and they'll be distraught. No signal is akin to having no sensible life on earth anymore. What would be the purpose for us to exist if we didn't have signal? Things would come to a grinding halt. Like, it's like a bird that flies into a glass window. Like, huh? what happened? That's how we would be. We would literally know not have a clue what is going on, and how to cope with a life without signal. It's sad if you think about it, because something you can't see defines your life. It's, it's, it's who you are. Have you ever thought, what if it wasn't the signal that died? What if God went silent? How hey, can you imagine a world without God? The day that heaven goes quiet, where God's not talking to his people, there's no prayers being answered, there's no grace for us, there's no provision for us. It's literally like, Heaven has become like Elvis. It's left the building. And we've got nothing. We've got nothing to hold on to. Heaven has left not only the building, it's left the town, it's left the world. What would that be like? You see, we, we should be able to imagine a world without signal because we lived like that for thousands of years. It will take us time to adapt Bring some of the old stuff back. You see, the signal 
is just a technological event that started off with the telegraph and the telephone and the radio, and it's progressed since there. But before that, we didn't have it, and we survived. We would survive again. But if God had to withdraw his presence, I think we are doomed. No Holy Spirit to guide us, to convict us, to prompt us. No nothing from God. I can't, you see, we can't imagine that because no one alive and no one who's ever lived since the creation of man has had a moment when there wasn't God involved in earth, on earth, and in our lives. The closest we came to this God going quiet on us was the 400 years between the book of Malachi and the book of, of Matthew. Now, the theory is, in those 400 years, God wasn't talking to the people. They, they find no manuscripts, nothing to indicate that God was actually active then. It's like God had gone silent for 400 years and then makes this dramatic reappearance in the form of an angel who tells a young girl, you're going to have a baby. And you'll call him Jesus or Emmanuel, like it says. But for 400 years, nothing. God was like, not there. But I'm not talking about 400 years. I'm talking about forever. Can you imagine? No God for the rest of eternity. I don't know. You know what would happen? We'd have no hope. And without hope, your life and my life would be meaningless. We will merely exist. We're born, we grow, we die. We've got nothing to hold on to, nothing to work towards, nothing to expire. We merely exist. We use up oxygen and then we become fertilizer. That's it. Now I want you to know, hear me clearly, God is hope. And because God is involved in our lives, we have hope. In Ephesians 1 verse 18, if you've got your Bible, turn with me there. And, and Paul's praying this prayer to the church in Ephesus. And he says, I pray that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened. Okay, so that you would know in your innermost, listen to this, that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his inglorious inheritance in his holy people. 1 Corinthians 15, 19. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are almost people to be pitied. So what's, what's Paul saying to the Corinthian church? We got hope. Because of God, because of Jesus. But that hope carries us through this life into our future with Jesus. And then in Romans 15, 13, it says, May the God of, come on, read it with me, may the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace. And just in Paul's letters, we don't have to go anywhere else, we can find countless occasions when he speaks about this hope that we got in God. Without God, no hope. So in my opinion, the world needs God because hope is what keeps us going. And the world needs, listen clear, clear, clearly now, closely now, the world needs the people of God to be the hope of this world. You see, people out there are in despair. It's literally for millions of people out there, like the signal has died. And the only thing they've got to hold on to is people who have got hope and people who believe in God and people who are spreading that hope. And that should be you and I. We are the hope of this world. God chose us to make a difference, to share him with others, and he is hope. Now, hope has got uh, a worldly translation 
and it's got a biblical translation. Now, um, I went to the dictionary, and the general consensus across many dictionaries is this. Hope, listen to this, is a feeling of expectation or a desire or a wish for a certain thing to happen. What a narrow description of hope. It's a feeling of an expectation or a wish. The Bible defines hope like this. Hope is an expectation with certainty, okay? With certainty that God will do what He has said. That changes it completely. You can see the difference. The one is a wish or a desire, and the other one is something you and I can be absolutely certain about, that God is with us. Now, we all know Hebrews 11, verse 1. Now, faith is the confidence in what we hope for and the assurance of what we do not see. Now, it talks about hope, but it brings hope and faith into a relationship. You can't have Faith in faith or hope in hope. If you got faith, you got hope. If you got hope, it's because you got faith in God. You see where I'm going? The two are closely interrelated. You cannot remove God and hope. You cannot separate them. Then you've just got a wish. And we know how many wishes ever come to, don't we? You, you, to, to have true hope, you've got to have an object for your faith. And his name is Jesus. And that's what makes all the difference. And that is what the world needs from you and I. I like to call it the God factor. The world needs the God factor. They need to know who is God, what God is capable of, and what God is able to do if we believe in him. See, it's all about God. And if the world wants to survive and thrive, we need hope. And who is hope? By now, I hope you understand that God is hope and is the essence of our hope. Without that, we would just revert back to a wish. Just for a minute, okay? Imagine this. Imagine you're one of those 12 disciples the day after the crucifixion, okay? Their signal had died, okay? Their hope had gone. Jesus was dead. And they would have probably sat around and said, I wish we had spent more time with him. I wish he was here. I wish he didn't go to Jerusalem. They would have a whole lot of wishes, but absolutely no hope. But what changes Hope or a wish to hope? Knowledge of the future or a certainty of the future. Okay? Had they known that when Jesus said that this temple will be broken down and raised again in three days, if they understood that Jesus had said, I will be resurrected, they would have in that moment not despaired and wished they would have had hope for a future because they were certain that Jesus was coming back. This was just a temporary situation. The pain would pass. The loneliness, the sense of hopelessness would be for a time only. They would be able to endure because they had a picture of the future. And hope gives us that picture because we understand what is happening. We understand that right now, Jesus isn't with you and I in person, but he's gone to prepare a place for us. You see, our hope is in the future. He's coming back. We've got faith in that hope. He's coming back for you and I. He's coming back for the sons and the daughters of God because right now he's interceding for us and he's preparing a place for us. So I can live my life now, okay, with all of this turmoil knowing that I can endure because something better is coming. 
I don't have to cross my fingers or hold my thumbs. I've got the assurance that Jesus is going to return because my hope is in God the Father who sent the Son and said, I'm sending him back to come fetch my children. But hope does more than that. Ron Keller wrote a great article on hope, and, and, and he says, beyond eternal life through Jesus' finished work on the cross, our hope brings us three important rewards. Number one, joy and peace, like in that Romans 15, 13 scripture we, we read. It gives us strength and courage. David called on the people who believed in God to be strong and take heart because God is hope. And it gives us confidence. In Isaiah 40, verse B, listen to what it says. The grass withers and the flowers fall. Okay, Talking about what's happening in the world right now. But the word of the Lord endures forever so we can have hope and we can have hope till we overflow with the hope and we impact other people with that hope. I read the Psalms and, and, you know, when David, David, like, he often pleaded with God, don't turn your face from me. It's like he could almost comprehend what a world would be like without God in it. It's like he, he, he was able to fathom how desperately he needs God. So he pleads with God on many occasions, don't turn your face from me because then we got nothing. We've got no hope in this world. You see, without hope, you and I are as destitute as everyone else. Desperation would rule in the world. It will be chaotic. Survival would be our primary concern. Moral standards would drop. It will be dog eats dog. It will be the strongest will survive, and evil will thrive. It will, it will, you know, as a society, we'll be forced into this type of mindset, eat or be eaten. Some are going to stand and others will be stood on. That's what will happen if God had to go silent, if he had to withdraw from this world. It reminds me of, and I love these movies, the Mad Max movies. If you're old enough, you'll remember. Almost that type of scene, like dog eat dog, the strongest will survive type of thing. But, but, <laughs> I love that word, but. You see, but because of people like you and people like me, there's hope for this world. But then you've got to be the right type of believer. Okay? I think we've got two types of believers. And right now the world is crying out for one type. Those who have hope. You see, realistically, a lot of people in this world, a lot of people in our world, maybe even in our workplace, in our homes, in our families, feel like there is no hope. And they need people like you and I to keep the signal alive, to be the connection between a lost and hopeless world and God. Right now we have in our society the haves and the have-nots. Both are struggling and in between those two groupings of people should be believers giving hope to both. We should be a blessing to the world because we have hope. We should share the abundance of grace and give hope. We should tell the world there is a God. He's alive and well. Let me introduce him to you so you also can have hope. We have not abandoned in this world. We got a God who is very much concerned about us in the world. And we need to be that type of believer because the world needs us out there. But we got another type. And I want to read a scripture before I explain them. Isaiah 41. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. 
They will soar on wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Those are the believers who are filled with hope. But we've got the others. Type two. The believers who feel weak. They're just plodding along, living one day to the next day in survival mode. They look much like the rest of the world done. They, they, they don't walk all around. They've got, barely got energy to kill because they've let what is on the outside on the inside and has destroyed their hope for everyday life. And we cannot afford as believers to paint this picture of God to the world. We've got to get to a place where we are the hope of the world, where we are the connection between heaven and the world, and we give this world hope because it's crying out for something that it cannot find in everything that the world offers. It can only be found in heaven, and you and I are of heaven, only passing through this world. So the burden of responsibility is on you and I. Your hope cannot be in yourself. It cannot be in your skill set. It cannot be in your boss. It cannot be in your paycheck. It cannot be in hopefully winning the lotto one day. Your hope is useless unless it is in God. And it's time that you and I stand up and declare who our hope is in because we got the blessed assurance that God the Father, Jesus the Son, and the Holy Spirit is alive and well and living in us, and we are going to share that with the world. You must be filled with hope. Colossians 1 verse 28. This luck just describes to me to a T what the world needs. It says, you and I, Okay? You and I, the ones supposed to be keeping the signal alive, we are the hope of glory. It says in part B of that verse, Christ in you, the hope of glory. Let's be that, people. Come on. We're capable of a lot more than what we've become. Let's at least have a hope in Christ and share our hope with a broken world who needs people like you and people like me to stand up and say there's a better way. His name is Jesus. Can I pray for you? Lord, what an encouraging word. But help us today, each one of us, listening online or in person, Lord, help us to make it practical by receiving this word and applying it to our lives, changing our mindset and becoming your hands, your feet, and your spokespeople. Help us, Lord, to have utmost hope in you, your promises, and what the Bible says about you and what you do and what you feel for this world. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Wow, thanks so much for tuning in. Thanks so much for listening this morning. Um, I get excited about a word like this where we get inspired to be more. Okay? We love you. See you next week. Thank you for being here once again. We really, really appreciate all of you. Catch you on the flip side, which... In church language is see you Sunday.